Okay, hi, welcome. Hi, thank you. You are alive. <laughs> so, how many of you are writing front end applications using JavaScript or TypeScript? Okay, and how many of you are using the new fancy stuff, uh, WebAssembly, binary JavaScript? Okay, a couple of you. So, I, I have to tell you, and I have to be per perfectly honest with you, for all of my life, I was a server guy. I don't care at all about UIs, okay? <laughs> Especially if they have to run in a browser, yeah? <laughs> um, but we have many customers that, that do care, okay? So, uh, you know, and um, I'm helping them, writing them in a secure way. And, and uh, you know, Java or browser-based applications just in general are a security nightmare. They are. Yeah, it's not the fault of JavaScript, it's not the fault of whatever, it's, it's, it's just the, 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 the fact that they are running in a very hostile environment yeah, uh, that is called the Internet and the World Wide Web and so on. So, I felt really bad for my customers, right, because even more than in the back end, it seemed like the, the, the guidance how to protect and write applications on the front end has changed even more often. Right? It it's went from, you know, like a pendulum going this direction, you have to do it like this. Oh, no, that's all wrong. Now it's swinging in this direction. You have to do it like this to fix your stuff before. Oh, that's wrong too now. So the way I see it, and that's kind of like the, the idea or the, the, the goal of the talk is, I think now that we've seen both extremes, I think that the truth as very often is somewhere in the middle. And that's all that is, and that is what this pattern is about. It's called BFF, the backend for frontend pattern, which is all about um, using the best of both worlds, using the UI technologies you have on the front end and using the security features you have on the back end and combine them together to make something meaningful. Yeah? So that's the, the whole idea of that talk. Uh, my name is Dominic, and I've been, whoops. Uh, working for many, many years in, in that space, helping customers building authentication and authorization uh, systems and helping them secure their applications. And uh, one, one central piece of that work is uh, two protocols that I mostly care about, which is OpenID Connect and OAuth. That is how I spend the better half of my career, by implementing them in this thing called Identity Server, which is um, um, an ASP.NET Core add-on, if you like, to build uh, OAuth and OpenID Connect uh, server capabilities into, into your software. So that's my background, basically. Um, and, you know, as part of that, of course, I needed to help, you know, because at the end of the day, the backend guys have to realize the only reason the backend exists is because there are front ends to connect to it, right? So that's kind of like the way it works. So, um, I basically want to explore a little bit of the history, how people were writing browser-based applications in the past, yeah, and what is wrong with one approach and what is wrong with the other approach, and I think where is the sweet spot where we're going to end with, okay? So I want to first have um, a look at what I call the cookie era. But before I even start, I should set the scene a little bit, yeah, because... Um, I wrote a blog post a long time ago in 2020. It was called Spas Are Dead. And this got picked up by Hacker News, right? And people on Hacker News have a very short attention span. All they read was the headline. They didn't even bother to read maybe the first line after that, which said, yeah, it's, it's, it's a joke, right? But they were like going completely crazy on me, like, this guy does nothing, knows nothing about Spas. They are not dead, blah, 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 blah. Um, if they would have taken the time to read um, what I was talking about is I was proposing a, an alternative approach to secure spas, okay, which was a blog post I wrote uh, earlier and which was like the, my very first ideas around how to use the back end for front end pattern to, to secure those applications, right? Um, but one thing, they had, they had a point with one thing is, you know, that spas are many things to many people, right? And when I mean spas, you know, the world I'm living in, I'm not a game developer, I'm, you know, like, I'm living in, in this boring business world, right? My customers are writing business applications, right? Uh, forms over data, you know, corporate stuff, you know, things like that, yeah? Um, and in that, in that um, uh, world, 
you know, we typically do stuff like we do authentication via OpenID Connect, we do single sign-on, we do federation with external providers, yeah, software as a service style, um, applications and so on, and we are also calling APIs, okay? So if you are living in that world, then that's what I meant with the current way how we do sparse is wrong. If you're not living in that world, then you might have different approaches that I don't know about, but that's just not what I want to talk about today. Or my focus is on how to to secure business applications, okay? And you know, business applications can be a whole lot of things, right? I mean, the Azure portal is a spa. Yeah, that needs security, w would you agree? Um, uh, the banks are sparse these days. The health, you know, the, the healthcare systems are written in JavaScript, right? I mean, they need security and they all fall under, under this category that I want to talk about. So, as I said, the first thing I want to talk about is like how you did sparse and they, they weren't even called sparse by the time, like back in the days, okay? So many, uh, many customers we have, you know, they started like in the early 2000s with web forms or MVC, right? Classical server side web rendering style, right? Where you render the page and you did a post back, back to the server and, and then suddenly this Ajax thing became fashionable, right? Um, for those who are old enough, you maybe remember when Microsoft showed the Ajax control toolkit, like an, an add-on for ASP.NET, like, look at that, no flickering, no more browser postbacks, it's all so responsive, isn't that cool, right? And they started shipping jQuery with ASP.NET, for example, right, to enable people to build these more interactive experiences, right? But what these applications basically were, they were classic server-side rendered apps spiced up with Ajax, right, to make it nicer, yeah? And because the classic server-side um, security mechanism was cookies, they also used Ajax to do the cookie, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, they also used cookies to, to do the Ajax calls. The nice thing is it just worked. There was no extra code necessary, you know, it, the, the browser didn't care if it was a postback or if it was an Ajax call, as long as you had a cookie that would, could flow to the back end, it all just worked, right? All was good and happy until someone discovered cross-site request forgery, yeah? Which is, um, you know, you, you, you'll see that theme here that many attacks in the browser have the word cross at the beginning, right? Because the way I like to see a browser these days, it's like a, a little operating system, right? Where every tab is a process that you need to protect from other tabs, right? Um, but there were some shared resources like cookies, for example. Um, and the whole idea in browser-based attacks typically is how can one app attack another app? And that's where the cross site comes from, where site typically is the assumption it's coming from a different site, right? And they, they want to attack you. So what's cross site request forgery? Um, you know, it is just the way how the browsers worked by the time is that you have a browser, you have a tab, you go to that, to your application, you log into the application, you get your authentication cookie and all is good, right? Now you're opening another tab in the same browser and you're going to an evil application, yeah? That evil application starts making calls to the, to the back end of app, uh, app.com and by virtue of having a cookie from app.com, the browser will happily send that authentication cookie back to app.com, right? So in other words, in that uh, tab, now the evil application can make backend calls impersonating the locked on user in this tab. That's cross-site request forgery, yeah? Um, so let me show you that uh, example because uh, Every now and then I have people in the room saying, this can't be true. If that would be true, the web would be broken, right? And they are right. It is. <laughs> okay, so let's, let, let's do this. I have two applications here, my app and evil app, okay? So let's run my app first. Just to illustrate the problem and the solution as well. Okay, so here's my app. Imagine this is a, uh, an app, I'm logging in, right? Imagine that this is now some thing that makes an Ajax call to the back end that, that, is, that, is, that is doing some work under the currently logged on user. Doing work as Alice, good, okay? So now let's run evil app. I mean, who could resist, right? 
Yes, of course I will click this. <laughs> but before we click it, let's just have a look what it does. So let's go to the page source. And you see that I, I don't even need to do any JavaScript here. All this is doing is basically doing a cross-site post to the other application. Okay? So what do you expect to see when I click this? I'm doing work as Alice, right? Because I did a post, the browser sent a cookie along, I'm authenticated in the other, pa in the other tab, so to speak. Yeah, that is cross-site request forgery. <laughs> okay, and of course, you know, um, I don't, I can make this much smarter, right? I, I don't need the user to click on something. I can have a JavaScript thing saying submit the form automatically. Right? I, I can make this in a hidden iframe, so they won't even see the kittens. <laughs> Never. Yeah? <laughs> so, so, yeah, that is, um, is cross-site request forgery, right? And if you um, were building APIs and server at endpoints using cookies as the security mechanism, you were vulnerable to this attack unless you protected yourself against this. Okay? So what is the protection mechanism? Well, it is adequately called anti-forgery <laughs> okay um so the whole idea is this yeah and 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 probably probably everyone knows this or should know this because this was part of uh, mvc right from the start right that, that there was this attribute on your controllers validate anti-forgery token right and uh, what this basically did is when you were rendering down a form it was basically issuing a cookie the so-called anti-forgery cookie um, and it was basically, ha that had a value, and they put the same value in a hidden form field called the request verification token. So now, when you post that form back, right, uh, both the cookie and the hidden field post back to the server, this attribute kicks in and makes sure that the both values are the same, right? So now, if you imagine now my attack scenario I just showed you, if I'm doing this cross-site form post, I don't know the value of this. Okay, so it's missing, and then the server will reject the post. Yeah, so we can we can do that. It's easy. Um, let's go here, and on my on my app. Uh, sorry, on my app. Oops. On my app, here's my do work. Right, I would do a uh, validate anti forgery token. Okay. So run this again, my app. Okay, I'm logged in as Alice. Um, run the evil app again. Click here to see kittens. Doesn't work anymore. Right? Because that request verification token is missing. The the the, ad, the, the, the filter said no, you're you're not allowed in. You you get basically an exception on the server. Okay? So why why is this important? Well, um, while this attribute was part of every single MVC template you can imagine that Microsoft put out, it was not part of any of the web API related templates, right? So many people didn't know about this attack um, because it was not on, in the template, right? Also for web APIs, you need to write, or for HX calls, you need to write some extra code. Right, because you, you you don't just do a form post and this thing flows. You would have to write some JavaScript code to fetch the token from the form, put it on a header, then send the header along with the cookie, and then have some code comparing the header value with the cookie value. And that all of that was never part of MVC. That's why, believe me, I have done many code reviews in my life where people knew about this for a UI, but did not even know that this was an issue for APIs. Right? And they were using cookies and they were vulnerable to cross-site request forgery. Okay, that's just the way it is. Um, and again, this is like 15 years ago, right? We, we, are, we are basically trying to work our way up to today. Um, so, so what happened next? Yeah? Um, the IETF, which is this uh, standards body, right? The Internet Engineering Task Force, they became aware of this problem, and they were, they were working on this thing called OAuth, and they thought like, huh, what if we could extend OAuth in a way that you could get rid of your cookies all together in the browser and use access tokens instead, right? Access tokens don't have this issue because they're not sent automatically. So, so we could solve this problem, right? Um, 
but to get access tokens, basically by the time you had to do like cross cross site calls to the token server to ask for a token, get a token back, and so on. And this wasn't easily possible because um, cross origin resource sharing didn't exist by the time, right? That there was no easy way to make cross site AJAX calls by the time. Yeah, that the same origin policy prohibited that. Yeah, so they came up with uh, a, a simplified version of doing that, which is called the implicit flow. Okay, um, they knew they're making a lot of security compromises there, uh, but they wanted to make it work for browser-based applications. The, the implicit flow worked like this, basically. Here's your JavaScript. It makes a GET request to the token server, and it gets back a, 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 get, a, a GET request back, and the access token was on the URL, right? And then you would store that URL, that, that token, and would start calling APIs. No cookies involved, yeah? So that looked good. This actually made it into a real standard in OAuth 2.0, yeah? Yeah, until they realized that there's a different problem here. It's called uh, cross-site scripting, right? Um, so the first problem we had is, is that token transmission over, over URLs is extremely leaky, right? URLs end up in log files, in the browser history, in headers, in reverse proxies, wherever you can imagine these headers are getting stored, because typically the assumption is there is no sensitive data on a URL, right? It shouldn't be. Um, so this became a security nightmare, actually, because now these tokens were spread all over the place, right? Um, and you had to write some complicated JavaScript code, for example, to delete the browser history after you got the token and uh, whatever, right? Um, so that, that was the first big problem here, that the transmission via this redirect mechanism was not very secure. Um, so they basically said, okay, we should use a different flow now. Yeah, don't use implicit flow anymore. If you have written your application using implicit flow, you, you're doing it wrong now, yeah? It was okay yesterday, but today it's wrong. Yeah, so they basically said, okay, there's another flow in OAuth that is better. Basically, you start a front channel approach, you know, like you, you, you go to the token server um, and um, collect some artifacts, but the, the actual token is not coming back on the browser. You're now making an AJAX call to the back end and retrieve the token outside of the URL, so to speak, yeah, to solve the URL problem, okay? And then in the end, you have to store and manage that token. Next problem, is, is storage mechanisms in, in browsers secure? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> uh, I mean, secure is the wrong word maybe, yeah? The, the browser has several ways to store data, right? It could be in memory, it could be in session storage, could be in local storage, could be in web uh, index DB, all kinds of things, right? But all of these mechanisms are by design accessible by JavaScript, right? And now with the upcoming threat of uh, cross-site scripting, yeah, what cross-site scripting really means is, is that somebody else can execute JavaScript code in your application, right? You're getting some string, you're not properly sanitizing that, you're outputting it, it happens to be JavaScript, bang, the attacker runs code in your process, yeah? Um, up till today, this is not a solved problem. If you look at the OVAST top 10 for the last 10 years, it was always between uh, um, number one and number three. It's kind of like going up and down, but it's not a solved problem. Yeah, um, cross-site cross scripting is, a, is a, real, uh, a real problem that still happens today. Um, and in other words, if now somebody can execute JavaScript code in your application, they can reach to whatever storage mechanism you're using and exfiltrate those tokens and send them away. Okay, this is not, a, not an exotic, uh, I don't know, dystopian thing. It's, it's happening, actually. <laughs> okay? Um, oh, yeah, and there's more really scary stuff going on. You remember um, the Spectre attacks? You know, like, um, we're basically uh, exploiting, exploiting um, Intel CPUs that when you send some weird stuff, you, could, you are now starting to read memory, right? That was a main thing for servers, but Google found out with, with valid JavaScript, you can provoke Spectre attacks in the memory of the browser. Okay, so I don't think a browser is a good place to store sensitive data. It's just the way it is, okay? So the OAuth folks 
kind of said like, yeah, it's not perfect from a security point of view. You should ex um, reduce the exposure of these tokens. There's this thing called refresh tokens, for example, in uh, OAuth that gives you long-lived access to an API. They are forbidden in implicit flow because it was just too dangerous, right? I mean, getting an access token is bad. Getting a refresh token gives you a way to get new access tokens. Yeah, And since um, JavaScript applications are public clients by design, there's no client secret. If I steal your refresh token, I can happily get new access tokens as long as I want, probably. Yeah, So they didn't allow that and came up with other mechanisms or workarounds to, um, to do this, right? Um, Let me show you, just so that we are all on the same page here, uh, let me show you uh, an example of, a, of an app that does everything from within JavaScript. Right, so there, there, there's, there's no backend involved here. It's basically, as you can see, all I'm doing here on the backend is really just serving static files. Everything else is happening in JavaScript. Yeah? So when I run this, um, app you see now you know that's how far my ui skills go um i can basically log in i can call apis and so on right so let's try this let's log in okay i'm logging in and yeah um missions uh, mission accomplished right i now have an access token in the browser so i can call my apis right um so i think i can even call the api yeah, it works, okay? Um, but if I now look, um, if I now look at um, my session storage in the browser, of course, this must be stored somewhere, right? And here it is. And of course, if I can now inject JavaScript into this application, I can exfiltrate the token and steal them. Yeah. Okay. Next challenge. <laughs> token and session management. So, so let's say we're, we're going down the JavaScript route. There are no refresh tokens, so we can't, ref you know, we, we can't get new access tokens, or we should not do that, right? Um, so they came up with a different technique called silent renew, and the idea was that you're opening an invisible iframe that does another token request under the covers, and the cookie is flowing to the server, and while, while the user is still logged in, you will get new access tokens without having to have a refresh token, and when the user signs out, it won't work anymore, which was kind of like not a bad idea. Yeah? Um, so that um, utilized an iframe. Um, then the next challenge you have when you're writing a real application is, um, uh, session change notifications, right? So when the user logs out from the server, maybe your JavaScript application wants to know that there's a logout going on to clean up data and, and lock him out, right? So how do you do that? Well, again, an another iframe technique was invented that basically, I I'll show you in a second how that works, yeah? Um, long story short, they found some workarounds to make this a little bit better using iframes, yeah? So let me show you that. Um, Let's just do this again. Log in here. You see now, um, there is um, a renew token. Okay, so when I when I click the renew token button, don't let click it. Yeah, you see that? I'm getting new tokens. No flickering in the browser. Mission accomplished. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that is, and I and I show you how it works. Um, that is. Uh, let, let's do inspect. You see here, um, here's my application. So when I renew the token, you will see for a, for a split second or so, a new iframe coming, going, going up that is, does, does do the token request and give me back a new token. See that? Okay. That is the replacement for refresh tokens in the browser. So a workaround to make that security story a little bit better. Here is the other thing I talked about. That is an iframe that points to an endpoint on the identity server, right? Uh, it's called check session. And basically how that works is you open the iframe and just leave it there. And then a server side event is coming from the server back to your client telling you that the user is locked out. You should now clean up your stuff. Okay. So I, I can show you that too. So if I go to the, the actual token server, you see here I'm logged in. So when I click the logout button here, magic happens. Okay, and that basically is a server-side event coming from the token server down to my JavaScript client 
and that are basically the, the, the two things you need to write a real application. You need token lifetime management and you need session lifetime management. Okay. Cool. So that was kind of working. And to be honest, we wrote a client library like seven years ago that is pretty popular. It's called OIDC client.js. Um, and we s decided to uh, um, archive the repo one and a half years ago because it was just, I shouldn't swear here, so I, I won't. <laughs> it was very bad. <laughs> and bad was not the library. What was really bad is, is that the JavaScript landscape and the browser landscape is changing so rapidly. Yeah, having to maintain a library that is supposed to work in all browsers is just a nightmare, right? Um, that combined with, you know, new techniques in JavaScript, Webpack, and all of that stuff. I mean, you know, did, did you know that even um, opening a pop-up window in a browser is not standardized? Chrome does it differently than Firefox. Firefox does it differently than, uh, what else? Safari, I guess, yeah? Um, but people wanted to have uh, login pages as pop-up windows, yeah? Whatever. Yeah, so we decided now we are, we are too old for that. Um, if somebody wants to take it over, they can. There, there are actually some guys who take, took it over. They, had, they now have a TypeScript version of that, which was another thing that people asked for. You know, I don't care about TypeScript. Um, anyways, so this library, uh, this, 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 this um, spa app I just showed you is using our library, which automated all of these things. Yeah? Um, now, going back to last year, uh, is it last year? I think it is last, 2021, late 2020. Um, the browser vendors decided they now need to fight back on uh, tracking mechanisms in browsers, right? Like uh, ad networks and, and this, uh, all that stuff that people use to track you across websites to give you better better uh, ads, basically, yeah? And they Id identified that one of the techniques that people are using to do this secret tracking across sites, guess what, is iframes with cookies. So now they are deciding we're gonna turn this off. We, don't, we won't allow anymore iframes going to, uh, to cross site in, uh, sorry, we won't allow cookies anymore going cross site in iframes. Do you see a problem here? I just showed you some two brand new specifications from the OAuth working group that solved the problem with iframes and cookies. Well, not anymore. <laughs> so today, there, 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 there is one company that did that so far, which is Apple, right? And Safari has a reasonable market share, right? So if it only would be Firefox or something, people would say like, yeah, that's a hippie browser, right? Who, 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 who uses that? But it's Safari, right? It's Safari on macOS and on iOS, which has a 15% market share. That is enough to ask yourself, huh, do I have customers that use Safari? You probably have, right? Um, of course, other browsers like Brave and Firefox, they do the same thing now, but no one cares about them. But guess who's coming next year? Chrome, okay? And with Chrome, they turn this off. I can tell you it's gonna be the same disaster as two years ago when they turned on same side cookies, right? Where they actually had to realize, oh, beginning of 2020, we just broke half of the internet. Maybe that was bad timing. Yeah, because all of the websites stopped working, including things like, you know, healthcare systems, Red Cross, first responders. So they had to, they had to remove that feature again. And then it came back again, end of 2020. Yeah, so let me show you that. Um, actually, let's, 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 let's take the app I just ran, oh, which is not running anymore, um, and just run the same bar in Safari. Okay, it looks almost the same. Um, now, just to show you what's happening now is this. I'm, I'm doing login, right? I'm going to the server, I log in. Um, and then I will get back my tokens and so on. And then the client will open this iframe to wait for session change notifications, right? Now this iframe does not contain my session cookie anymore. So the server will immediately say, you are anonymous. You, you're not even logged in, <laughs> okay? And that's exactly what, what we're seeing now when I log in here. So I'm logging in, all is good so far. I'm coming back, out, okay? because the iframe 
does not contain the session anymore, which is the cookie. Um, and of course, the, 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 the renew thing doesn't work either, of course, because that is, that is using the same technique. So, yeah, this is not working anymore. Yeah, this, this even has a name now. It's called the Google Chrome Cookie Apocalypse. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's right now it's planned to happen in 2023. There is actually the EU trying to prohibit that, yeah, because they know that all of the government stuff isn't working anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah, not a good situation to be in. Um, yeah, so that's what I just said. Yeah, these things don't work anymore. Now, for something good now, there are also good browser changes, okay? So, and, f you know, um, one of the, the, the good browser changes is that all major browsers are basically trying to solve now the cross-site request forgery problem, okay? So, rem remember, what was the problem of cross-site request forgery? Basically, the, the browser got a cookie from server one, um, and then somebody else who, who was not server one posted back to server one and the browser was sending the cookie along because it belonged to server one, right? That, that's the, the, the essence of it, yeah? Now, guess what? They have this thing called same site cookies. And what that expresses is, is that if you have a cookie for server one, you should only post it back if the post back comes from a page originating from server one, right? And, and if the page is coming from server two, you don't post that cookie back. And now you have to wonder why wasn't it like that all from the start? Wouldn't that, you know, that would have saved us a lot of pain, yeah? So, yeah, same side cookies. As I said, this, this caused a massive problem when Chrome turned them on, beginning of 2020, but now they, they all turned it on, and arguably it makes the internet a safer place. It was just breaking everyone, and they all had to learn that in really hard lessons, yeah? Um, what does that mean? That means that now, suddenly, in 2022, there is, maybe you should give cookies a second look, right? Because they are much better as they used to be 15 years ago, okay? Um, and just to, you know, as a side note, um, same site cookies basically means um, that cookies can flow freely within the same site. Now, some people are confused what's a site. And what's an origin? An origin is very strict, right? An origin basically um, is the combination of protocol, um, server name, port. That's an origin, right? And the, the browser prevents cross-origin requests. Now, what's a site? A site is much broader. Basically, if you have a top-level domain like myapp.com, then all of the subdomains are on the same site. Meaning, if you have app1, myapp.com, it can post cookies to app2, myapp.com. Okay? That is kind of like the boundary here. Um, which, of, of course, makes total sense if you trust all your subdomains, right? And in big companies, right, many teams own different subdomains. Do you know that every team is writing secure code? Or is there something that could happen if, you know, crm.mycompany.com posts to mysecureapi.mycompany.com, right? Um, so, yeah, just be aware of that. Same site is not like the, the, the silver bullet but it, by default, built into the browser, without you having to do anything, it will shield you from attacks from other sites. Which is not bad to start with, at least. Good. So, now, with all of that said, now we are here today. There is now new recommendation from the IETF. They removed implicit flow from OAuth because they realized it's a bad idea. It's gone, it's deprecated, you shouldn't use it. They, they, they even removed it completely from the RFC because they are now doing a revision of OAuth. Yeah? Um, so now, what do we do? Do we do cookies again? Do we stay with, with tokens? what's the best way to do it, right? And how often have we already rewritten our application so far? Yeah? So, um, there is some good, good documents coming out of that, uh, especially the one here. Uh, it's called OAuth for Browser-Based Applications, uh, Best Current Practices, which is not a spec, it's more like a, a guidance document. Um, and the way they phrase it, and that is basically what I totally agree with, there are two types of JavaScript applications. The ones with a backend, and the ones without a backend. So, 
the ones without a backend, you know, like this, 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 this stream from the, the, all of these JavaScript hipsters, right? All we need is a CDN that deploys our HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's all we need because from that point on, it's a standalone application running in the browser. Yeah, don't think so. Um, if you're staying with this architecture, then you're pretty, pretty much in, in the boat of doing everything from JavaScript and just what I showed you, right? With storing stuff in the browser, fighting with browser changes, and all of that. So the, the spec says very clearly, if you're not dealing with sensitive data, stay on this architecture. But if you're dealing with sensitive data, and that's what most of my customers are doing, actually, probably all, then you should consider this approach here where you are using the browser and your favorite browser framework, Angular, React, whatsoever, to show the nice UIs. Right? But all of the security, all of the token management, all of the interaction with your authentication system and so on and so forth, it should be on the server. Okay? Yes, and that is, as I said, the one thing that I totally agree with. Now, um, there, there's a second spec now that, um, that you know, this, this is such a young pattern, but still starts, pe people start to now make variations of it already. <laughs> um, and there, there, there's one pattern called, so if, if you come across that, they, they call it TMI BFF, uh, something with, uh, it, it, it's supposed to be like a, a funny wordplay, something with mediator, something, something, but it's also too much information. Um, and the idea is, is that you're basically moving uh, parts of your security stuff on the server and parts stay on the browser. I don't agree with that. And I, have, I argued with them until they added this wording here uh, into the spec, which is called a full BFF where everything is <laughs> happening on the server offers better security. Right? That was just getting this sentence in was an interesting experience. Um, Okay, let me quickly show you the TMI approach and then forget it again. I mean, no, no just, you know, that you've seen it before. So the, so the idea with the TMI approach is basically, here's your front end, then if you need a token, you go to the back end, the back end does all the interaction with the token server, right? And then stores the token response on the back end. But then when the front end wants to call the API, it can get the token to the front end and call the API which in my opinion is not really the solution because you're still ending up with tokens in the browser. Yeah? They might have a shorter lifetime and all of the refresh handling is done on the server, but ultimately you end up with access tokens in the browser. That's why I don't like this approach. Yeah? Again, my preferred approach is what they call the full BFF now, where basically everything is happening on the application server and whenever the browser wants to do something, it calls the application server and the application server calls whatever they need to do. Okay? And the, the browser is purely for UI. Okay. So that is a, a BFF. It's called backend for frontend. And the idea is, as I, as I just said, you get the best of both worlds. You get the responsiveness, the JavaScript stuff, the, 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 the UI stuff in the browser, but the security stuff is on the server. And I think that is a good compromise. Okay, so let's 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 do this. Um, so um, I, I should mention um, I, I've been working on, on a product for that um, that that puts these things all together. Um, it's it's free um, if you are if you you or your company is making less than one million USD a year, which is a pretty fair deal, I think. Otherwise, if you're making more than one million, I guess you can afford it. Um, but the idea is this: most of the 60% of the plumbing you need to build a BFF is already in ASP.NET Core, okay? And what is this? It basically is your OpenID Connect and OAuth client library. It is, it is part of ASP.NET Core. This is the thing that goes to the OpenID Connect server, that sends the right parameters, that handles the response back from the server, that gets the tokens, and so on. Session management is part of ASP.NET Core. It's, it's, it's basically the, the cookie handler, right? The thing that sets a cookie, that keeps the session alive, that maybe does uh, exp um, sliding expiration or absolute expiration. Basically, the thing that lets your front end call the back end under your control. The thing that is not part of ASP.NET is token management. So basically, once you have the need of calling APIs that are cross-site, you need an access token. Access tokens means you need refresh tokens. Someone must need to manage them, right? Get a new refresh token when the other expired. That is a, an open source library I wrote, which is 
available on the internet. And then the last interesting um, point is now your front end wants to call APIs, right? Um, and there are two types of APIs in my mind. So when you know when, when you start refactoring your application to use this pattern, you realize there's a whole bunch of APIs I'm calling which are exclusive for my front end. No one else calls them, right? So what's the point of putting them onto a shared server? I, I can just put them in the back end, and I, I don't even have to go cross site for that, right? Um, and there's probably and there's also the the case of remote APIs where an API is shared between multiple front ends. So it must be on a shared server, and in that case, then the back end will help you to proxy those requests over and send the response back to the to the to the front end. Okay? And the very last thing is the UI. Okay? So choose whatever UI you like. You know, could be Razor, could be MVC, could be React, could be Angular, could be Blazor. Doesn't matter, right? It's just something in the browser that shows a lot of pictures. Yeah. Good. So yeah, I just mentioned that. Um, so what are the building blocks? If you want to build a BFF backend yourself, um, first of all, you would need ASP.NET Core's help, st static files, right, to, to, to surf your static assets down to the browser, HTML, JavaScript, CSS, all these things. Um, you would need the ASP.NET Core OpenID Connect authentication handler to do the, the coordination to the authentication system and token system. And you would need the cookie handler to do all of the same site cookies and anti forgery protection and so on. Okay? So that's all there. If you've done this before, you know what, what I'm showing here. That's the OpenID Connect handler. You just connect it to your, to your company authentication system. Okay? Um, once the authentication is done with that system, you need to start managing the session. As I said, the session um, is a part of ASP.NET. All you basically need to give the front end is a way to trigger the login process, right? And that's how you do that, basically by providing um, an endpoint in your backend. In, and if JavaScript or whatever goes to that endpoint, you trigger the login server side. And you, you, you do the same for the logout, okay? And after the login, you then just use the standard cookie handler in ASP.NET Core to set the cookie. You see they have support for same side cookies and all of that, so you can make this really secure. Um, let me show you then. So, we're here. So you see this is basically just a, just a normal ASP.NET Core Web, web application, okay? The, the only difference is that we don't have server-side UI. The UI is all JavaScript, yeah? So, um, and you see all the configuration going on here. Here's my OpenID Connect plumbing. Here's my cookie plumbing with the same side settings and so on. So when I, when I run this, uh, it's the front end host. You see, that is, everyone needs a to-do list, right? So um, now if, if, if I want to start the application and log in the user, you can see when I hover over here, all this login button really does is it does, it does a redirect to a local endpoint called login, okay? And then this local endpoint on the server side will trigger the login to the authentication system, just like before, okay? Um, login. And now I'm logged in. Um, what do I have in my in my browser now? Ugh, nonsense. Um, no cookies in session store, right? All I have, uh, sorry, no no data in session store. But I have this BFF cookie, right? And you can see it has it is secure. It's HTTP only, meaning no JavaScript has access to it. And the same side mode is strict, which is the highest mode you can get for cross-site request forgery protection, right? So in other words, what this is now doing is it, it just allows you to call back to your backend and nothing else, okay? You're basically sandboxing the front end to be only able to call the backend, right? Um, so if, if I, if I want to log out again, you see the same, same thing. I just invoke a local logout endpoint. So if I do that, I'm back here. 
and I'm logged out. Let's log, log back in. And if the front end needs to know who the user is, right, for personalization reasons, like here, like logged in as Bob Smith, things like that, right? There is a local endpoint on the server that basically uh, returns whatever session information you want to return back to the client, and you see my UI skills are really not <laughs> so good. Um, but you see, basically, it, it gives you back things like what's the name of the user, you know, and you can put in arbitrary stuff here, but it, it's only accessible, it's protected by the same side cookie, and only the front end can retrieve that information and no one else. Cool, so that's working, that's great. Um, let's go back. What else? do we need? Yeah, we've just seen that. Oh, by the way, the, 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 there's a great trick. You know, like uh, one of the challenges we have was uh, session change notifications, right? So how does the front end know if the user has signed out on the server, maybe in a different application, yeah? Um, and since this iframe trick is not working anymore, you can, you know, you can come up with something really fancy, like some sort of signal R thing, right? That gives you a notification from the server back down. Um, very nice, starting with .NET 6.0, there is a way now that you can make requests to the server without uh, triggering ex uh, uh, sliding expiration cookies. So, so let's say, for example, you want to have like a, uh, every minute you want to go to the server, so like, is the user still logged in? Is the user still logged in, right? If you would do that, then you would, if the cookie is sliding, you would prolong the session every time you're doing that, right? Starting with, with .NET um, 8th Minute Core 6, there's now a way how you can suppress this. So it, you really can check is the user still logged in without touching the server-side session, which is quite nice. Um, right. Now, now who da, um, how, wh what's the modern solution for session logout notifications to the back end? Well, there, there, there's a spec that is around for quite a while, but nobody implemented it um, because people were, were relying on another iframe-based approach that doesn't work anymore, which was called front-channel notifications. There's now a, um, another spec which is called back-channel notifications that if you have a good token server, they can just basically not notify the backend. Hey, the, the user session has ended, which means the backend ends the session of the user. The next time you ask for the session, it will say it's gone. That's how you can trickle down um, session change no notifications from the token system down to the uh, UI. Now, ASP.NET Core does not implement this right now because they, would, you know, they didn't see a need, but you know what? Microsoft's big authentication product called Azure AD is always, by design, cross-site to your applications, right? Because your, your application runs on mycompany.com and Azure AD runs on login.microsoft.com, right? All of the things I just mentioned to you, cross-site iframes, notifications, will not work anymore when Google pulls the trigger. So you can be sure that pretty soon this will be part of ASP.NET Core, <laughs> built in, or you just use our implementation. Good. Um, let's talk about the last thing, calling APIs. And I, and I already did that, right? So my, my to-do list thing, oh, actually I didn't, I think, yeah? I, I did not call an API yet. Right, so here is, uh, you know, uh, have a beer soon. Okay. That is calling a local to-do list controller, right? So I can now add my to-dos and delete them and so on. Um, but this to-do controller, as you can see, is local to my application, okay? So I'm not even crossing a site boundary, which means I don't even need OAuth access tokens because I'm just doing a call to the same site, which is protected by the cookie, which is all good. Okay, um, and you can even make that even stronger by by a nice little trick. Let me show you that. Um, it, it it sounds silly, and I didn't believe it to start with. But basically, when you're doing the the backend call to your local API endpoint, yeah, you are all, all automatically protected by same side cookies. Okay, that is what we get from from the browser for free. But what if you even want to protect yourself against other subdomains in your, on your top-level domain, right? Um, and the reasons might be manifold, yeah? Um, you can just add a header, and you can call this header whatever you want, and you can set the value to whatever you want, yeah? 
But basically what that means is, by virtue of doing an Ajax call from the browser that contains a cookie and a custom header, the browser will always trigger cause free flight requests. Okay, so cause is the thing that would allow you to do cross-site API calls, right? We, we don't want that. We don't want cross-site API calls. We want to prohibit them, okay? So, so when you're doing a cross-site API call, the browser uses this thing called cause, cross-origin resource sharing. There are two modes in cause. Um, one mode is for get requests, where they basically just do the get request and then expect a certain header to come back from the server, and only if the headers match, they pass the response down to JavaScript. That is the, the easiest one. But for more complicated calls, and that's exactly that thing makes it more complicated from a browser point of view, they first ask the server, are you okay with me making this call? And only if you say yes, I will actually do the call. Why is this better? Now remember spectre attacks, right? Spectre attacks means you probably can read the RAM of the browser process. So it would be better if the data wouldn't even ever come to the browser in the first place, right? So that is, you know, it's beauty. <laughs> so, yeah, so just by adding this static header here, you have protected yourself against even same site attacks, right? Where uh, subdomain one in your company has some dodgy code running that attacks subdomain two on the same company. Yeah, or maybe your subdomain was stolen, right? Have you ever heard of sub, uh, subdomain takeover attacks? That's how attackers can basically steal a subdomain from you because you have a dangling DNS pointer pointing to Azure and they just have to register the Azure website with the same name and suddenly they run code on your domain. These things exist. I told you the web is not a peaceful place. <laughs> okay, so, so that's how you call local APIs. No need for access tokens. It's just protected by cookie and uh, anti forgery protection. So what if you want to call external APIs or remote APIs? Well, you know, essentially what you need to do is you need to do reverse proxying, okay? That doesn't sound sexy, but it works, yeah? And how you do the reverse proxying, totally up to you. There are many, many ways of doing that. I like this new thing here. Have you heard of YARP? Which is a really stupid name. It's, it's called yet another reverse proxy. <laughs> Um, but it's easy to Google, believe me, YARP will be the first hit when you Google for YARP, right? Because I guess YARP is just, you know, whatever. Anyways, it's a Microsoft product, and the idea is that the reverse proxy is just a middleware in your host, meaning you have an in-app reverse proxy that, that you can configure in a way saying like, hey, when a request comes in on slash API, forward that to another server, get the response back, and send the response back to the front end and the front end does not doesn't, does never know even that this was a remote call. It all looks like a local a API endpoint. It's great, right? Um, yeah, so that's exactly what we did as well. So you see, um, let's, say, let's say we um, remove the to-do controller from our front end here, and I go to my program CS. You see here, uh, sorry, startup, it's now called, or it was called. Um, you see here at the end, um, I just, remove the local API endpoint altogether, and then I replace that with what we call a remote API endpoint. And that is utilizing YARP under the cover. So YARP is not like a, a server thing, it's, it's, it's an API, right, that you can use yourself. So, and what this basically says is, whenever a call comes in on slash to-dos on the local host, forward that call to this server here. Oh, and by the way, because now we are on a cross-site scenario, Please attach the current access token of the user so it all just works, protected by OAuth. Right? So if I run this again now, uh, sorry, run the back end first, which now has the, the to-do controller, yeah, and run the front end. Um, run the front end again. Okay. And as you can see, I can still use my to-do API. The front end is unchanged. It doesn't know anything about this, but our API has moved to a completely different server and is now protected by OAuth so, so that other clients can call it as well using OAuth, maybe server to server, maybe from another application, maybe, maybe, maybe from a mobile app, whatever, right? But the first hop 
front end to BFF is protected very strongly with same side cookies and anti forgery. And then on the server side, we make a transition to a server to server call, attach the access token, get back the result, and show that back to the UI. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was it. So, yeah, because that, that, that was the thing I was working on for the last year, basically triggered by various co uh, customer problems. And once we solved it for the first time, I started to see the pattern here, and that's where we turned it into a framework. Yeah? So that's, that's my conclusion. Okay, so I've, I'm, I'm old enough and I have enough gray hair to, to remember the cookie era and the token era, and they both were problematic, okay? <laughs> and uh, this here, I think, the first time, I think this makes sense, yeah? Do a clean separation of concerns, do your UI in the browser, do your security on the server. Any questions? Yep. You mean like if somebody steals the cookie? Well, that was always a concern, right? That would mean that they have some, some sort of um, local access to your hard disk, maybe. Yeah, this, 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 this doesn't solve that problem. Yeah? So YAP actually does support um, uh, WebSockets and GRCP. Yeah. Any other questions? Good. Then almost on time. Thank you and have a great conference.